So, welcome to the last discussion of the first module. But before we get there, let us have a quick recap of what we have already done. So, in our first discussion, we surveyed the general properties of life, you know, through the eyes of an alien and we defined what evolutionary biology is all about and then we asked a couple of questions. Then I told you that in order to answer those questions, it is uh, going to be better if we look at the history of evolutionary thought and how the thoughts have evolved over time. So, that is what we did in our second discussion where we looked at the pre-Darwinian evolutionary thoughts. Then in the third discussion split over two videos, we looked at how Darwin and Wallace arrived at their thoughts and what exactly were Darwin's thoughts about evolution through natural selection. Then in the fourth discussion, we looked at what happened in the field post Darwin and we continued our discussion all the way till the beginning of extended evolutionary synthesis. And finally, with all that information, all that those insights with us in the final discussion, which is this one, the one where you and I are talking, we are going to go back to these two questions that I talked about and uh, we are going to deal with those two questions via two different analogies. So, let us start with the first analogy. So, let us assume that uh, you go to a certain place, a certain room and you find a person lying there dead on the floor and you ask the question that what has led to her death. Now, obviously who will you ask this question? You will ask these questions to the people who are there, the kind of experts who are investigating this uh, particular death and there are two kinds of experts over there who will actually give you slightly different kinds of answers to the same question. So, the first expert is going to be the forensic expert and when you ask her what led to this lady's death, she will tell you something like you know okay it was caused by a bullet injury or a knife injury or whatever. Basically, she will tell you about the mechanistic reason for which this lady is dead. The other kind of person to whom you will ask the same question is going to be the investigating officer of the case and she is going to talk to you about what can be the possible reason behind or leading to this lady's death. Is it a suicide? Is it a murder? What caused that? What was the motive? And so on. So, you can see that the same question about a phenomena can be answered in two slightly different ways and this is what is known as the so called proximate versus ultimate dichotomy. So, approximate reason for a phenomena is the underlying mechanistic reason for which the phenomena happened in this particular case her death, the cause of her death. But the ultimate reasoning talks about the context within which that particular phenomena has emerged. In other words, what has led to this thing to happen. So, with this analogy in mind, let us go to our first question. What was our first question? Our first question was when we tried to define evolutionary biology and we said that uh, evolutionary biology tries to understand how the tremendous biodiversity that we observe came about and it also asks why the organisms are the way they are. And then we picked up this second phrase, the one that is uh, highlighted over here and we asked that is not that supposed to be the domain of molecular biology or genetics. And now, with the analogy that we have in mind, we realize that what we are talking about over here is the proximate ultimate dichotomy. So, yes, if we are asking a proximate question of why the organisms are the way they are, that is what molecular biology, molecular genetics deals with. But if we are asking an ultimate question about it, then that is the domain of evolutionary biology. So, give you an, to give you an example from uh, biology. Um, let us say you are asking the question that you know why is my skin so dark. Now, at one level I can simply tell you the darkness of my skin is due to the presence of 
this pigment called melanin. That is a proximate mechanistic answer. At the same time, you can also ask the question how you know, why exactly this skin has become dark due to the presence of melanin and for that the answer is going to be okay, I am a human being, you know I evolved in Africa, in Africa the solar radiation was very intense, solar radiation contains UV, UV when it interacts with the skin leads to skin cancer, in order to protect from that you know it is important to have melanin therefore organisms which had melanin were at an advantage etc 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 right. So, that is the ultimate reason, the contextual reason for which I have melanin and hence I am dark skinned. So, evolutionary biology essentially deals with the ultimate reasonings for every phenomena in biology and therefore, evolutionary explanations actually permeates into every single sub discipline of biology. Okay. That is why evolution is I mean the processes that we study in evolution are obviously you know something that belongs to the domain of that subject, but the outcomes or the things that we study the patterns that we seek to explain they actually permeate across the entire subject right. So, this was the first question. In order to understand the second question we again need to look at a slightly different analogy. This is a slightly more involved analogy. So, just bear with me. So, the second analogy is let us say about a slightly dystopian future wherein you go inside a library and you find that it is full of torn pages of books okay, something that looks like this and then you start looking at the pages and you realize that for some reason you are not able to read the page numbers of any of the books and therefore, you have no idea how many books are there, you have no idea which page belongs to which book, all you have are the information that is available on individual pages on both sides of individual pages. Okay. So, you start reading those pages and you start noticing that many of those pages are mentioning a certain character called Harry and you notice that you know sometimes this said Harry it looks like you know he is behaving like a kid, sometimes he is behaving like an adult. You can make out that sometimes Harry is sad, sometimes he is angry, sometimes he is afraid, sometimes you know he is uh, generally you know uh, almost des disparate and so on and so forth. So, as I said you do not even know if it is the same Harry or not, but you see you know Harry in different forms and the same is true with some of the other characters that are interacting with Harry. So, you find this very strange character called Snape who it seems that at some points he is trying to protect Harry, at some times uh, he is trying to kill Harry, at some times he is fighting with Harry, at other times he is teaching Harry and uh, again you know it is a complete bewildering array of things that this character is doing and ditto with all the other characters. Okay. They are behaving in very peculiar ways. Now, from any given page you can understand what the character is doing in that page, but you do not really have a clue of why exactly the characters are doing different things at different places and as I said you do not even know whether the they are the same character or they are different characters who happen to have the same names. Now, at this stage somehow somebody waves a magic wand and you are now able to read the page numbers on each page right. So, you quickly sort all the pages out by their numbers and you see that there are 7 you know set of pages which are all called 1 2 1 2 1 2. So, you think that okay, maybe we are looking at not one book, but 7 books over here. So, similarly you arrange all the pages which have 3, 4, you arrange all the pages which have 4, 5 and so on and so forth. Now, you take a particular 1, 2 page and you look at all the 3, 4 pages and very soon depending on how the sentence is continuing you are able to piece the correct 1, 2 page with the correct 3, 4 page then the correct you know 5, 6 page with the 1, 2, 3, 4 page and so on and so forth. And once you do this 
before long you see you get this ok and once you get this you realize that ok these are seven books in a series and there is a certain character arc so in each book Harry ages by one year so in the, in the first book he is aged 13 in the second book he is aged 14 and so on and so forth and that's when you try you know start realizing why is it that Harry was sometimes behaving like a 13 year old kid and sometimes he was behaving like an adult you understand how Snape's relationship with Harry evolves over time and then suddenly you start understanding why is it that Snape was behaving so differently in all the books and the same is true for all the other characters that you have. In other words, all the information that was there in the pages, they remain the same. But suddenly, all those information, they fall in place in context with each other and once that happens, then all that information that you had in the pages, they suddenly make a big story. They suddenly start making sense in context with each other. And it is in this way of looking at the word sense that Theodosius Dobzhansky you know, made that famous comment. So if you remember, we started by saying that this, here is this famous statement by <coughs> Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And we asked why is it that such a such an enormous, such a sweeping statement is being made, right? And if you remember over the last you know one or two discussions, we saw that there are so many patterns in biology, there are so many observations in biology, all of which start interacting with each other, start falling in one coherent narrative once we appreciate that all organisms are related to different degrees and there is a certain pattern in which they are related, there is a certain pattern in which they have quote unquote evolved. So, evolution actually provides a unifying framework for understanding both how the life forms, why the life forms are diverse and in what way they are interconnected with each other. And it is this notion that allows us to link all those disparate observations that I was talking about. If you do not have the framework, then all the biological information that you have, they will still stay, but they are all going to remain as isolated curiosities, right? And in that sense, they will simply be like, you know, stamps in your stamp book. Sure, you can maybe arrange them by country or maybe you can arrange them by color, but that is about it. You will not be able to find too much of relationship between various stamps that have been issued in a, from a particular place or during a particular period, but that in some sense is not very satisfying. This binding thread of evolution is what differentiates biology from simply being a collection of observable facts. Now, here is the other very important thing over here. We discussed some of those patterns and I alluded to a few more without really telling you what they are. I just said you know molecular data, I just said DNA data without actually telling you what exactly we observe over there. Some of those patterns we are going to uh, you know look at in our next discussion, next module when we look at the evidences for evolution. But there is no known pattern, no known observation in modern biology to the best of my knowledge till date that is inconsistent with evolution of life forms. Okay. So, we are actually talking about everything known and when I say known, I do not mean known at the time of Dobzhansky. I am talking about known at present day in 2025, there is nothing which is inconsistent with the evolution of life forms. And again, the same thing that you know this is why evolutionary biology ends up being like a connecting subject for every subdiscipline in biology.